Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're just going to let folks kind of uh, slowly but surely uh, file in. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Matthew Thornton. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications at the Ontario Real Estate Association. Uh, so wonderful to be with you uh, this afternoon for a very informative and timely briefing from our team on the Trust and Real Estate Services Act uh, and some new regulations that are coming forward in April of 2023. Uh, we have a jam-packed uh, program for you today, complete with a briefing and overview of what's coming down the pipe in terms of those new regulations, uh, as well as uh, some question and answer period uh, towards the end of our presentation. We've got experts from our legal team, our, our forms team, uh, and of course, uh, our real estate team on the call today to take your questions about what these new rules mean uh, for you and your business. To take you through that presentation, uh, we're going to be led by uh, the chair of our TRESA task force, uh, Ray Ferris. Ray Ferris is a past president of ARIA, as well as a broker of record with Erie's Edge Realty uh, in Port Rowan, Ontario. So without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Ray, who's going to take you through today's presentation. Ray, over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matt. And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, I'm going to provide you with an update on the Trust and Real Estate Services Act, or TRESA, as we will be referring to it throughout the remainder of today's presentation. Today, we're joined by a team of ORIA staff experts, lawyers, and realtors to delve deeper into the TRESA regulation process. Matthew Thornton, who you've already met, is ORIA's Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications, and Cassandra Agnew Walker, who is ORIA's Head of Standard Forms, and they have both been very instrumental in the lobbying, the passage, and the implementation of TRESA since its initial review in 2009. We're also joined by David Tang, who has worked with our association for over seven years as external counsel to ORIA, as well as Catherine Cavan, who has been integral to supporting the drafting of the key components of the new Trust and Real Estate Services Act. I want to thank David and Catherine and the entire ARIA staff for their tireless work on this issue, and thank you guys for joining us today. The pre presentation that we're going to do today will provide you with a very high-level overview of some of the key implications of the policy changes based on the updates to TRESA. Before members begin to think about the types of questions that would, you would like to have answered following today's presentation, we want to remind you that today is all about understanding the bigger picture and what this will mean in terms of the implementation of TRESA. For example, many members are concerned about the new rules surrounding the open offer process. Like what would happen if the seller opts for an open offer process, but halfway through changes their mind and wants to go to a closed bidding process. These questions, these types of questions and others will be addressed in future webinars hosted by ARIA and additional resources that will be circulated to members following this, this meeting. However, I think it's critically important that we take this 30,000 foot view today in response to the questions that we've been receiving from Ontario Realtors, partially in response to some of the media coverage that's been out there. But we're going to get started and take you through that today. And we're going to start by giving you a quick overview of the phased approach to this review of TRESA, talking about how we got here, where we are now, and how the newly published regulations are going to affect you and your business. And then we're going to wrap up with a chance for members to ask questions from our team of experts. ARIA has spent the last decade lobbying to bring about changes to the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, or what we all call REBA. Each year, 200,000 real estate transactions involving close to a half a million consumers are completed in Ontario. No government rule or new piece of red tape can replace the protections offered by a highly trained realtor working with a well-informed consumer. With the much needed review of REBA, ARIA wanted to that Ontario was a leader in North America when it comes to real estate standards. Since 2009, ARIA members have had over 750 meetings with us. We sent over 50,000 emails related to REBA reform, and we 
have received the support of four private members bills on personal real estate corporations alone. We also created a REBA review task force in order to lead the largest direct to member consultation in ARIA's history. And in February of 2020, the new legislation called the Trust and Real Estate Services Act passed third and final reading in the Ontario legislature with all party support, becoming the new governing legislation for Ontario realtors. Due to the many key aspects of TRESA, the government decided to split the consultation process into three phases. So as part of phase one, ARIA wanted to ensure that the government of Ontario prioritized the creation of supporting regulations that would allow realtors to form personal real estate corporations. ARIA was successful in working with the province to create a modern regulation that delivers the greatest benefits to our members while maintaining strong protections for real estate consumers. And to date, over 10,000 members have been able to take advantage of financial savings through the, through the establishment of their own PREC. You will also recall that along with the new PREC regulations, the province brought forward amendments to the TRESA code to permit the use of new terms to describe Ontario salespersons and brokers, meaning that members can now use descriptors such as realtor and real estate agent as part of their real estate advertising. From there, the Ministry of Government Consumer Services entered phase two of the consultation process, which is the phase we are now currently in. The ministry divided phase two into a number of different to ensure that each piece of legislation could be fully analyzed in order to develop the supporting regulations. The first step in phase two focused on updating the Realtor Code of Ethics, which is a key pillar of professional standards in our industry. The ministry really wanted to rewrite the code to make it more principle-based by moving more detailed prescriptive elements to the general regulations and focusing the content of the code to provide guidance to registrants and encourage a greater sense of professional responsibility. As part of this, I want to highlight an early achievement in ARIA's work on the code. In ARIA's submission on the draft code, ARIA's presidential advisory group on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was chaired by realtor Deval Morrison, made recommendations to include an obligation to refrain from activities that would be considered to be discriminatory. The ministry took this recommendation into consideration and followed ARIA's guidance, redrafting the existing abuse and harassment provision to now explicitly require compliance with the Ontario Human Rights Code, which will have long-term implications for realtors and for consumers for years to come. The remainder of the phase two process focused on developing the regulations under TRESA. In April, the ministry published the general regulations, as well as changes to the code of ethics, educational requirements, and the newly developed RICO Discipline Committee regulation. To analyze those four pieces of work, ARIA's TRESA task force, which is made up of realtors, educators, and legal experts, met regularly, and we developed over 100 pages of analysis to be used as part of our submission. Although the regulations published by the ministry in April covered a multitude of new changes, today I'm going to be highlighting six key issues which we believe will be the most important to realtors and their businesses, from highlighting new definitions created by the ministry to categorize consumers, to understanding how the new open offer process will look under TRESA. So on that note, let's get started. Under both the new code of ethics and general regulations, the ministry is proposing to make changes to the options that the public would have for interacting with a registrant to simplify and help them understand their choices. REBA and its regulations currently provide for registrants to work with clients under a representation agreement and with customers under an agreement to provide services. This has served to actually be confusing for consumers, as the public may not be aware of the differences between the two terms and the obligations that registrants owe to the client or customer. Under the new regulations, the ministry is proposing that a person would have two primary options for significant interactions with the registrant during a trade, 
namely becoming a client or choosing to become a self-represented party. If the person becomes a client of the brokerage under a registration agreement, the person would receive services, including representation. If the person, however, chooses to be self-represented and not enter into a representation agreement with a brokerage, the person would not receive services, including representation from a registrant during a trade. The term service, which implies a significant and high level of obligation on the part of the registrant, would be reserved for use only with clients. That will help reduce confusion amongst cons consumers who may have different expectations for a registrant's duty to them if they are being served by the registrant. The option to be a self-represented party would replace the current term of customer that currently exists under REBA. A self-represented party could generally interact with a registrant in two kinds of circumstances without the interaction constituting service and, con and crossing the boundaries of an implied agreement with the registrant and party. These interactions include a registrant providing a self-represented party with general information relating to the business of trading and real estate, like giving a consumer general real estate market statistics. A self-represented party could also receive assistance from a registrant who is representing a client in a specific trade. If the assistance provided is incidental to work being done for the registrant's own client, provided that the registrant ensures that the self-represented party does not rely on the registrant's skill or judgment with respect to the interaction. For example, if a seller client was looking to speed up their sale, the registrant could assist the self-represented party with the mechanics of filling out an agreement of purchase and sale. As this is one of the larger changes and, and with more nuances than some of the other updates to the regulations under TRESA, ARIA is planning on holding a more detailed, tailored presentation on these new definitions and providing greater detail on this section in the future. Let's advance to information and disclosure obligations. As professionals, realtors play a critical role in educating their clients, their customers, and unrepresented parties about their rights, obligations, and options. This communication is relayed to buyers and sellers on standard real estate forms and clauses. With this section of the new regulations, the ministry has aimed to improve the information that registrants must provide to consumers to help them better, better understand the choices available to them. The ministry will require brokerages to continue to provide specified information to consumers before entering into an agreement with a brokerage. An example of this would be requiring additional content requirements for representation agreements, like details about the breakdown of remuneration between brokerages with respect to a multiple representation situation. To improve consumer communication with registrants, ARIA will continue to support enshrining more consumer-friendly disclosures in the regulations under TRESA. We will also continue to advocate against mandating designated agency or preventing consumers from working with a registrant who they know, like, and trust. Accompanying the changes under the previous section, the ministry has written into the regulations that registrants will have to provide consumers with a newly created information guide prior to providing any real estate services or assistance. The information guide, which the ministry intends to be written by RICO with ORIA's assistance, will replace ORIA's working with a realtor document. This guide will outline registrant client relationships provide examples of remuneration agreements and other obligations and rights that a client will have when entering into an agreement with their realtor. This information guide will also be available to self-represented parties. When it comes to the actual creation of the content for the guide, ARIA has already started to work with RICO to ensure that significant realtor experience and input is included. As with all aspects of the regulatory changes, the information guide will be provided to registrants before TRESS's implementation dates to allow 
us enough time to become familiar with the contents of the guide and become educated on how and when it should be provided to real estate consumers. The ministry created the new discipline committee regulation as a direct response to addressing and deterring unethical behavior by registrants through new mandatory rules for realtors. In an attempt to reduce bias during case hearings, the new RICO discipline committee will be made up of five or more members, one of whom will have no connection to the real estate industry. The ministry will also be expanding the scope of the committee. Under REBA, the discipline committee could only consider whether a registrant has failed to comply with the code of ethics and can issue a fine or require a registrant to take educational courses. With the new regulations, TRESA would authorize the discipline committee to consider whether a registrant has failed to comply with any provision of the act or regulations and have the ability to suspend, revoke, or apply conditions to a registration. As we move closer to the implementation date, ARIA will be working with RICO to develop commentary related to how realtors will be able to appeal decisions made by the committee and other processes related to their operation. As part of this section of regulations, the ministry wanted to update the rules to help RICO operate more efficiently and focus their enforcement efforts where they are needed the most. As we know, RICO does, does not currently have express authority to collect transactional data about real estate trades. The lack of access, this lack of access rather, limits RICO's ability to target, target its compliance and enforcement initiatives to activities associated with the highest risk to the public. To assist in this process, the ministry wants to improve transparency and promote consumer confidence by requiring RICO to make more information about registrants publicly available, including reasons for any revocation of a registration, refusal to renew, or suspension outright of a registrant's registration. The ministry will also permit RICO to collect transactional data, like information related to the number of sales that involve multiple representation. As part of their approach, the ministry wants to specify the circumstances under which RICO may require that registrants provide information related to a trade. Under this amendment, data can only be collected for the purposes of greater regulatory oversight and consumer or registrant education. To further ensure that these requests wouldn't be burdensome on registrants, the ministry has made sure that a significant time period would be allotted to allow the registrants to gather the information collected and again would only require the collection of this information within the constraints of the administration of the act or its regulations. The last section which we're going to review today is related to the offer process. As we know, REBA and its regulations do not regulate the practices of buyers or sellers. The changes under TRESA would give the public more choice in the real estate trade process by allowing a registrant to conduct an open offer process and disclose the details of competing offers at the discretion of the seller. As expected, buyers would be able to choose whether they want to participate in an open process or not. The open offer process is not mandatory. With with, with the traditional or closed offer process still remaining as an option for real estate consumers. As ARIA holds the pen for forms related to the real estate transaction, our forms team will be developing new and updated forms and agreements to support members who are working with clients who are choosing either a closed or open, open offer process. As work progresses on this topic, this is another area in which ARIA plans to hold a more detailed member webinar to walk through the regulations related to the offer process and give members more direction on the new products which they can expect to receive from ARIA to help them facilitate these transactions. As ARIA reflected on the new regulations, we created many comparisons with the help of our legal counsel to understand exactly how and where our asks were reflected in the new regulations. After two years of lobbying on phase two of TRESA, 
Aria was pleased to see so much strong alignment between our key advocacy points and the final set of regulations under TRESA. Although the changes under the new regulations are significant, Aria has a plan to work with the regulator and develop simplified realtor education pieces that will allow registrants to easily understand how these changes will, affect, will factor into their everyday interactions with the public. On that note, the ministry has set out an expected implementation timeline for the regulations to come into force for April of 2023. This deadline is a direct result of our recommendation from our task force, as members noted that the most important part of this process is giving ARIA's 85,000 members enough time to become familiar with these updates to the regulations under TRESA. Phase three is going to begin later this summer, and it's going to focus on the auctioneer exemption, administrative monetary penalties, updating RICO's registration process, and allowing realtors to obtain specialty certifications. As you may have noticed, the auctioneer exemption is one area where ARIA's asks on the new regulations did not align with the ministry's final regulations. Since the beginning of our work on REBA, ARIA has maintained that all exemptions under the Act should be reviewed, strengthened, or removed altogether. In January, the Minister's Office asked ARIA to draft regulatory language surrounding the auctioneer exemption that could be used in the general regulations. Since then, however, the Ministry decided to not include this loophole in this phase and is deferring a decision on the auctioneer exemption until phase three of TRESA development. To push back on this, ARIA sent a letter to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services, Ross Romano, outlining how the current rules regarding auctioneers allow those operating that way to bypass oversight and rules aimed at protecting consumers under TRESA. Many of you have heard of these operators in places like Ottawa and St. Catharines, for example. They have created significant consumer protection risks by marketing themselves as a full service real estate operator, misleading buyers and sellers into thinking that they are in fact a regulated entity when in fact they're not. Now that the outcome of the, the provincial election has been decided, ARIA has been working with RICO and real estate boards across the province to focus our lobbying efforts on the auctioneer exemption as a priority for RIA and realtors understand that this is not only a matter of fairness to registrants, but it is also a matter of consumer protection, and we intend on seeing the exemption for auctioneers strengthened under the next phase of the regulation development. So before we head into the question and answer session, I'd like to note that ARIA is already discussing how we can make the transition process easier for members prior to that date of April 2023. As I mentioned previously, ARIA will be hosting further sessions on various topics like the regulatory amendments to the open offer process and newly developed information guide later this year. And all of the presentations and subsequent materials will be available on ARIA's website. And if we do not have time to get to your question today, it can be directed to governmentrelations at ARIA.com. So before we open up the floor to questions from you, I'd like to pass things back over to Aria's Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications, Matthew, and he is going to talk to you about two exciting initiatives for realtors that Aria has in the works. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Ray, and fantastic job on that uh, presentation. Uh, lots of great information, and as Ray said, we're going to be taking your questions here just in a couple minutes, so if there's questions you'd like to see addressed by our experts, uh, please type them into a chat. We'll do our best to get it to as many as we can uh, today. Uh, and if we don't, please uh, send us a follow-up email and we will make sure we get back to you. But just two quick items you want to highlight for folks on the call today. We have over 2,400 members on today's call. So really, really outstanding attendance from folks I know interested in this, in this topic. The first one is uh, we're hosting a, a, a big conference coming up in the fall, our reality conference happening November 22 to 23 in Toronto. Uh, we're, we'll, Aria is celebrating its 100th anniversary at this event and it is going to be an exceptional conference. 
Uh, the only one of its kind featuring, I think, some of the top talent from real estate, marketing, and politics all on one stage for two days. Uh, go to realityconference.ca to register. There's an early bird price on right now. Uh, so if you go, you'll get a, a discount on tickets. At past events, we've had you know US presidents, prime ministers, uh, some of the leading uh, thinkers in marketing and real estate, uh, industry leaders. Uh, so don't miss it at realityconference.ca to check that out. Uh, one other thing we want to highlight for, for members just before we get to Q&A, um, a new service that we've, we've launched here at the association, a relatively new, uh, it's called LifeWorks. Uh, LifeWorks is a member assistance program offered by ARIA through our, our partners at Mor uh, Morneau Chappelle. It's a well-being solution that provides members with a 24-7 access to mental health counseling, uh, physical, social, and financial support. Uh, service is totally confidential and free. Uh, you just have to um, uh, go to the app, uh, which you can download on our website, um, uh, and it's, it's available to members and their dependents under 25. So to access uh, LifeWorks, you just go to aria.com slash LifeWorks, download the app, or there's a, a, a crisis line that you can use there as well. Okay, let's get to the question and answer uh, part of our program. I'm going to invite our experts to, to, to join the call uh, now. Uh, we've got a lot of questions uh, in the chat and we will do our best to get them uh, get to them. Uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, Robert and I'm going to throw this one to David uh, Tang. Uh, Robert asks, is there a definition of discrimination in the code or referred to in the code? Uh, David, do you want to take that one? I turn myself on. Sure, certainly. Um, the code, uh, by the code, I guess we're talking about the Ontario Human Rights Code. So what this does is it references uh, the Ontario Human Rights Code. It was one of the things that ARIA advocated for was the clarity uh, to ensure that discrimination was not simply mentioned at large without any clarity as to what that meant. So what we've actually managed to get the ministry to do in its regulations is to reference specifically the Ontario Human Rights Code, which is separate legislation that applies, I think, to, to uh, all Ontarians, as you probably are aware. So what we we're doing is we're looking at specifically all of the um, all of the discrimination requirements of the code as being the same applicable to uh, realtors as they move forward. So that's a bit of there's going to be a fair bit of clarity on that. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, our second question uh, comes from uh, Peter. Uh, Peter would like to know, how will the changes of definitions, I think he's re referencing the elimination of customer and the creation of the self-represented party, uh, affect placing an offer and uh, re remuneration? Uh, Cassandra, did you wanna maybe try to tackle that one? Let's go into the definitions. Unmute. All right. Uh, I don't think the definitions themselves will uh, affect submitting offer or remuneration. However, I think um, ultimately, you know, the Standard Forms Committee will be reviewing the definitions, how they might impact what needs to be in agreements. And I think ultimately, uh, services, service agreements will still need the details so it's understood what service the member has to provide when it comes to submitting an offer. One, one section sim simply clearly uh, identifies, you know, how the ministry, how uh, Tressa establishes the parties and the other will be how the member and the member brokerage relates their services to the actions that are required with those parties. Now, I didn't mean to go around a circle, uh, Ray, I think if there's anything else there, I, until we have an opportunity to do the comparisons to the potential revisions that the committee may be uh, recommending, uh, it's, in my opinion, it doesn't appear to be directly linked to the definitions. Definitely, they'll have impact on the relationship forms and then the decisions will be that of the member and their brokerage, what services are connected and how they're going to go about their business with offers. And of course, claims for remuneration is entirely that written concept as, as well. So I think for, for what you're doing, how you're receiving it, the disclosures of remuneration, that will all still be embedded in the documentation necessary around working with the parties in the transaction, in, in my opinion. So we'll see as, as it rolls out, Matt. Yeah, you know, thanks, Cinder. Great point. 
yeah, there, there is so much, uh, um, so much more work that needs to happen over the next uh, months. The regulations themselves have, have just been finalized. So I think in the last two months have been finalized. And so over the summer into the fall, uh, Aria working with Rico, our forms team and, and others, uh, would be sort of working to clarify um, a lot of these uh, changes and how they're going to impact uh, your business as well as things like forms. So, so more information to come today is really about high level briefing. And, and again, we're going to try to answer your questions as best we can. Okay, our third question, I think, uh, is probably again for Cassandra. This comes from uh, Irina. Uh, her question is, where does the new scheme of client uh, or self-represented party place a mirror posting service? Currently in mirror postings, it is possible to provide a service to customer, uh, but without providing representation. Specifically, does client uh, always imply and give rise to a uh, to common law agency? Uh, Cassandra, this sounds like one uh, maybe for you. I want David and Ray and you. Okay, let me move on. Um, ultimately, I think there's a lot of questions in there and maybe I can just tackle one comment at a time or one part of the question at a time. So common law agency doesn't disappear because of the TRESA regulations, no different than it didn't disappear because of REBA. So, so I think just to eliminate that, the brokerages and members need to be cognizant of uh, common law as well as other legislation and no matter what the topic is. So I'm gonna start with that. And also in the question, it appears the comment, and again, this is um, on the surface, my response to the question is that the reference to mere posting or limited service does not require the representation. And there's a number of different um, reading between the lines there. If it is an MLS listing agreement that has limited service or um, alternative services connected to the listing brokerage and the seller client, typically, you would have a client relation. So I can't say that I would speak to the fact that as they're referencing a limited service offering doesn't require customer or client or doesn't require client, one or the other. Um, we would typically see because of the requirement of the three pillars to put a listing on MLS system, client representation or representation was necessary as was remuneration, as was membership. Having said that, we won't go deep dive into that, Matt, but on the surface, I think there's some comments in the question about the fact that one business service or business model did not require a uh, client or customer, or in this case, client. Okay, so back to the main question. Having client versus self-represented, self I, I still don't think brokerage service is going to be affected. It's a decision of the brokerage and the individual members what services they'd like to provide to the parties they're gonna be working with. So on that basis, I think the clarity is what uh, Tressa and Rico will be looking for as far as exactly what are the two parties agreeing to and were there enough details so each of the seller or the buyer understood the service, the level of service, and, and specifically sometimes they even talk about explicit, explicit details that have to be spelled out and I think that's really where Tressa in many areas is carrying that message. So. I think the way it is, if a brokerage has a service, they're likely going to be able to continue it. However, there's those other peripherals. So um, leaving it at that, again, once again, the brokerage will review their services as um, connected to the new TRESA regulations. The documentation, as we have now, Forms 202, uh, all the customer service and the client representation agreements, they will be reviewed to know if they need to apply other language within so if that helps, Matt, I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'm really swirling in deep dive areas of that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so much more work to come. And thank you, Cassandra, for that. Um, um, and, and lots of questions in the chat about whether or not today's session is going to be recorded and available for uh, folks to view afterwards. The answer is yes, where we are recording this session. We'll be posting it to aria.com uh, later this week so that members can uh, can access it uh, for follow-up information. Okay, let's give Cassandra uh, a break. Uh, and I want uh, one for David. Uh, and David, this question is from Michelle, and she's wondering, is the op open offer process for residential only or commercial transactions as well? So the regulation will not differentiate between residential and commercial transactions. So the uh, potential for an open process is available to both. Easy one. Yeah, easy, easy. Um, applies to both. Okay, uh, back to uh, Cassandra. Uh, and a, a Cassandra, a question about Form uh, 810. And let me just uh, pull it up here. Oh, goodness, I think I just lost it. Hold on one sec. 
Uh, yes, it's from Peter. And he's wondering, um, is the, the Form 810 going to change with the changes to self-representation um, and uh, customer? Um, he says, uh, will the self-represented self consumer identify the brokerage, the agent, and all parties? So just to clarify, Form 810 is the working with a realtor, as is 811, 815, and 816. Mm. And I know, Ray, when you did the introductions in the overview, and if it's okay, Matt, maybe I could bring it back to the surface as we have sure. just had the, the regulations identified. There should be an information publication from RICO, which is likely going to be in lieu of the working with a realtor. So until we get the specifications of what's covered there in that publication, uh, we may either see uh, revisions to ours or we may see it uh, be replaced by that um, document that they're putting together. I'm actually wondering, Matt, and I may take this twofold, <laughs> who offers that up? They may be talking about 801, um, which may be just a, a, a slip of the numbers. So 810 is a working with a realtor. I could see this question applying. And so I've, I've sort of responded to that by we need to see what uh, Rico uh, and, and of course, with all of our consultations, uh, comes out with as a draft document. But if it's 801, which is the offer summary document, which is a retention document for brokerages, it does highlight that the brokerage working with the buyer is submitting the offer and confirming the offer is written and signed by the buyer. There may be some tweaking on that document because of the definitions, because of the terminology, because of the words that we'll need to see that comes from the buyer brokerage to the listing brokerage. So definitely, uh, and I apologize, Peter, if that wasn't supposed to be 801, but I thought, well, that if it's in my mind, it's likely in a member. So I've kind of doubled up on that question, Matt. Again, it goes back to committee to review and, and receive. And on the, the first part of it, it's the RICO document that I think we're really going to need to see as a draft before we get into our language. Yeah, 100%. Well, oh, thank you for that, Cassandra. Okay, let's go to Ray uh, Ferris, Chair Ray Ferris for this next one. And this is, a, I think, pretty straightforward. Uh, just a, um, a member looking for a little bit more information on um, whether or not we can explain the auctioneer exemption and just a little bit more of a deep dive into that issue. Uh, and then just a sort of a follow up to that uh, from our, our good friend Mike Douglas and Barry, uh, wondering um, if we have an idea of the current percentage of trades which uh, are you are using auctioneers currently. I think that's, um, I'm not sure we do have that information, Mike, but maybe Ray can shed a bit more light. Uh, first the exemption, Ray, and then it just a, an, a response to Mike's question. Right now, the current uh, regulations allow for anyone referring to themselves as an auctioneer to help a consumer sell real estate without any consumer protection of any sort whatsoever. So the best way I explain this to people who ask this question is any of us, assuming, pretending we weren't registered, I know we all are, but if we weren't, we could just call ourselves an auctioneer and go out and help someone sell their home. So Aria is advocating very heavily in phase three, as we mentioned, uh, to get this exemption strengthened. Uh, to Mike Douglas's question, I have not saw anywhere any information about the number of transactions in the province that are facilitated with the assistance of an auctioneer. Yeah, I haven't either, uh, Mike. Um, be, be maybe some good research to do, but uh, not, not, not on hand for today. Uh, okay, let's go back uh, to David. Uh, David, a question about, uh, the, the, again, the new definition seems to be, a, I think, a hot topic today on, on the call. Uh, and a member wants to know, what is the major difference between a self-represented party and uh, I, they're asking the customer rep um, in this case. So what's the, different, the, the difference between the old system versus the new system? I yeah. think maybe that's another way to ask that question. So, so unfortunately, there's not a, 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 a short uh, way to answer this. It requires us to sort of go through, and this will be the subject of a, a future webinar, uh, to sort of explain to everybody exactly how it works. But basically what they've done is they've changed some names. So a client is a client, but a customer is going to notionally, generally become a self-represented uh, person. Um, that's only in the context of an actual trade in real estate, obviously. Uh, so for example, if somebody you're interacting with doesn't end up participating in a trade, uh, they're not 
arguably self-represented person because there's no trade. So there are going to be sort of a few others uh, that, that you might uh, end up interacting with separately. And we'll, we'll cover that off in a, in a separate uh, webinar. But basically the idea is a self-represented person is anybody who is not a client. So that it'll come down to whether you're providing services uh, and, and or representation to a client. And if you're not, uh, and you don't have an agreement that provides for those services, then they're going to be either a self-represented person or somebody who you, who, who's not even that, okay? So that's probably the easiest way to think of that. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, David. And that will be, as, as David said, another uh, sort of focus webinar uh, that we'll do going forward. So our approach is very much going to be, uh, you know, today's a high level briefing, and then we're gonna do some deep dives into some topics that are of high interest to members, the open offer process, the new definitions are two areas that we will absolutely do some follow-up work on. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, this is another question for Ray. And this, Ray, this is maybe just a little bit of, um, I think first and foremost, the members looking for some background on our process related to the work that the task force did. So maybe if you can start with a, a bit of an overview of that and how the, the task force did its work in terms of reviewing and providing feedback to the ministry uh, on these new regulations. And then secondly, they're looking for a bit of information on what the purpose is of having a kind of a member of the public sit on the discipline committee. And I think we discussed that at, uh, at, the, um, at the task force as well. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, so what we received from the ministry was um, draft regulations. So that was areas of the regulation that they were considering. And the government or MGCS, the ministry, looked to us as experts in the field as to how we could make this work. And a lot of the stuff that we received, uh, we, we toyed with. We, we, we put forward what we thought would work best for Ontario realtors and, of course, Ontario consumers as well. So what we just received what the ministry was contemplating, and we helped them perfect it, if you will. Uh, with regards to uh, what was your second question there, Matt? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, the so the uh, the member wanted to know uh, so the the new reg, the new discipline committee regulations. All oh, right, yeah. Adding a, 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 a kind of a member of the public to the committee. So just sort of a, some background on why that uh, change is being made. Yeah, well, I think that is so that you can have somebody who really has no knowledge of real estate transactions like real estate education but i think what the ministry wants is to have somebody who's an outsider uh sitting there on the discipline committee to you know almost a sniff test how how, how does this look and feel to somebody who who really doesn't have real estate education like all of us do yeah yeah, it's, it's really about, I think, um, providing that um, non-industry perspective on, on, on discipline decisions, uh, that consumer sort of perspective, uh, very valuable, especially given the mandate of, of the regulator. So, uh, Array, a, a bunch of questions on the information guide, uh, sort of what's going to be in it, when are we going to be able to see it, all that kind of thing. I know it's very early days on that, but maybe if you can just talk a little bit about uh, our process around the guide going forward and, and uh you know, when members can maybe start to maybe see, I, I don't know if we have a date yet even, uh, yeah. but maybe start to see some information there. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, that is likely what is going to replace, as we've mentioned, the current working with a realtor document. And the ministry has said that RICO is responsible for drafting the information guide, but ARIA has held firm and advocated very strongly all along that we want ARIA input into the creation of this information guide. I mean, we've been very, very firm on that all along. Uh, we had a meeting with our counterparts at the regulator. And uh, you know what? We had a very productive, positive meeting with them. We expressed to them that we did want to provide input into the creation of the information guide. And they were very welcome to that idea. With regards to the question as timing, I mean, we don't have a time as of right now. Um, but We've already started the ball rolling about a month, month and a half ago. We did meet with Rico, as I mentioned. So uh, it's in the works. But as far as a definite date when we can show you something, that's unknown at this time. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Ray. Um, a lot of questions about sort of, uh, can we get a copy of the new regulations? Can you share uh, you know, this information? 
uh, what we'll commit to post post webinar probably later this week when we get this uploaded and onto our website an email with uh, links to all of this content the links to the to the regulations that aren't enforced yet remember they're not coming to force until april of next year uh, for members uh, so that they can access that information so we'll, we'll circulate that later um, a question for for david and i think probably cassandra as well um, just a member looking for some more information about what these changes mean uh, to sort of multiple representation more broadly. So that's, uh, that's I guess that's a bit of an open-ended question, but uh, whatever sort of information at this stage we can offer, uh, who wants to jump in first? Um, I'm unmuted, so why don't, I, why don't I start? So the regulations do not prohibit it. Um, there, uh, there, is no, there is no concern that uh, multiple representation acting for the buyer and the seller uh, is, is now prohibited. What the regulations generally do do is to try and sort of make it a bit clearer as to what sort of uh, information and disclosure you must provide uh, to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest uh, that, that exist. Uh, so that's been the approach. And it was something that Aria was very clear to the ministry about is that multiple representation is not a bad thing. Uh, it, uh, it can be very, very beneficial to both the buyer and the seller in terms of reducing the overall cost and providing clarity in terms of what, what can happen. But at the end of the day, what uh, as part of this entire process, there was a desire uh, on both the ministries and everybody else's part to try and make things clearer about what your obligations are. And that's what you see as a thread running through most of these regulations. We have uh, particularized a, a number of requirements so that it's easier for you and for those of you who are brokers to implement uh, the sorts of documents that your, uh, that your sales agents will probably need to, to, to work with to make it clearer and make it simpler so that you don't fall afoul of the already existing obligations with respect to disclosure and conflict of interest. Thank you, David. Uh, Cassandra, anything to add there? And I think David did a fantastic job. I might sum, summarize from a practical perspective as well, not unlike current regulations and actually the act, uh, the general and the code, they identify you can't do this without the consent of the party. So as David said, that, that isn't something that's now prohibited, but we might find the requirement. So for those that are very uh, REBA familiar and, and regulation and code familiar, you might find that how it's placed where the obligations of the disclosure, the information exchange, the documentation and the consent, it may be found in different locations of the regulations per se. Um, and, and I think just if members consider if they're uh, com complete with their process currently and their consumers are, are fully informed of the options of the services, how the services could be impacted. So you've got a beginning and then you've got a middle along the way to be cognizant of how uh, perspective is. They don't want any consumers confused in any way as I don't think any realtor or member does. And then you'll have that final point before negotiations, which will continue. So you've got a beginning, a middle and the end, constant communication, documentation, and essentially the same kind of details when it comes around to consent. So I don't know if that makes that summary and more practical, but I, 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 uh, I'm glad David took that front end and, and clarified. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Cassandra. Thanks. Great, great information. Okay, uh, a question from Henry, uh, and he's wondering about uh, the impact of Tressa on employees working for uh, developers. Uh, and I'm going to throw this one to David. And I, David, I think this kind of fits under the, the discussion we're having with the ministry around exceptions. But can you just clarify whether or not Tressa has any impact on, on, um, on, on developers and specifically employees working for developers? So the exemptions that apply to, um, and, I, I, and I have to look, I wasn't expecting this, this question, the exemptions with respect to a person working for a developer um, were not specifically amended in this go around. Uh, so I don't think that would be, um, that would be of significance, but I, I actually have to check and I just haven't turned my mind to it to be to totally honest. So um, we can certainly take a look again uh, and um, respond to that. But I don't, I don't think that particular exception, which was not a, a focus of any of the discussions we had with the ministry was raised at all. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, just to build on David's comment. Uh, so, so no changes to the builder exemption uh, under Tressa uh, are currently being proposed. Uh, that could be a topic for phase three, Henry. Uh, so we'll, 
we'll look to engage the ministry uh, on that. Uh, there are a number of things coming forward, though, through uh, changes to the New Home Warranties Act, uh, the new regulator, which has been created to regulate uh, re regulate developers uh, and builders. Uh, a lot of positive things happening in that space, which I think we've asked for things like a code of ethics for builders, for example, uh, really to level that playing field between uh, between builders of new homes and, and obviously registrants. Um, so a, a lot of questions on um, on, on, on whether or not uh, open offers can be um, used now in the current market. There seems to be some, some I, I wouldn't say confusion, but certainly uh, a need for maybe some more information on this. So I don't know, Ray, um, if you can speak to this at all, because the, the changes make it sort of seem like this is a, a brand new to the market. In fact, it's, it's you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can use that process now if you want. Yeah, and uh, I think this is uh, something that we should all be very proud of and happy that was achieved because there was a time when we were looking at these regulations and we were doing our work that we thought that the government may consider a ban on blind bidding outright. And it was only through the hard work of ARIA that consumer choice was preserved and consumers now have, well, they've always had this option. Uh, so really, I think what I like to say is that the association uh, achieved the status quo. Maybe what's different is that because of the media coverage that all of this has received, that there's more consumer awareness now, and maybe there's more member awareness now, which is a good thing, right? But at the end of the day, I think we achieved the status quo, and we stopped an outright ban on bidding all together. Yeah, that was, uh, I know that was a hot topic in the federal election uh, last year. And uh, up until the provincial election, that was a, a topic that we were actively engaged with the, the Ford government on. Uh, and, and it was, to be totally honest, under consideration. And uh, your team led by Ray and, and our leaders uh, were successful, I think, in, in convincing the government that that's not the best thing for consumers uh, at the end of the day. Um, uh, Ray, a, a bunch of questions on next steps and sort of looking ahead to phase three. You touched on it in your presentation, but I wonder if you can just kind of reinforce or reaffirm uh, what can we expect to see in this sort of next phase of the TRESA regulation work? Couple, I know a couple of new things that we're working on. Yeah, what I'm really excited about in phase three is the possibility of specialty certification so that realtors can take additional educational requirements to be able to certify, certify themselves as a specialist in a particular area of real estate, such as maybe a condo specialist or a recreational specialist or a residential specialist as examples. And I did mention earlier off the top that we were going to be looking at the uh, discipline, uh, the, the way that RICO uh, works within the discipline process as well. And Ray, can uh, a question uh, asked in the chat, can you talk about some of the specializations that we're kind of referring to? Like what, what specializations would uh, potentially move forward under the new de uh, designation? To, we we haven't got to phase three as of yet, but we know under this big giant umbrella of specialty certifications, it's something that we're going to be considering. You know, I you know I think of things like uh, specialty certification as somebody who trades solely in condos, as an example. But I mean, it's if the members have any suggestions that they would like us to advocate for, I already gave you the email address, governmentrelations@aria.com. Please let us know what your thoughts are. Yeah, the, the one that comes up uh, quite a bit is commercial, commercial uh, right. real estate and, and the need for a, um, uh, a specialty designation there uh, to, 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 to sort of help, um, help, um, help differentiate and help um, explain and, and clarify for consumers that, the, that there's a unique skill set on behalf of the register. Uh, okay, so we're, we're getting down to the end of our, our, um, our uh, presentation today. Uh, I just want to kind of offer our, our panelists and our, our, our experts a, kind of an open-ended opportunity to sort of uh, offer any final thoughts uh, to our members on the call today about next steps, about uh, sort of what they can expect to see from us on a go-forward basis. And then I'm going to throw it to Ray to kind of um, conclude. Uh, so does that, Cassandra, does you, is there anything you want to kind of wrap up uh, today's uh, webinar with today? 
absolutely. Uh, because there've been a lot of emails and phone calls in addition to, I know what GR and, and uh, your your team is, is doing. So, so, I mean, this webinar obviously is kind of like a first step of the overview of those TRESA regulations in depth. So it's fantastic. Hopefully the April bulletin was also read. I, I would encourage members and brokerages to be patient, continue the business a status quo. And that sounds like, okay, just keep doing what you're doing and don't think ahead. But ultimately these regulations come in effect 2023. And I know all of that was mentioned, but you've got to be patient in order to take time to review, to be abreast and really know how things might change your service. Then take a look at your services and identify and work with your brokerage to know how it might change come 2023. And of course, continue to be on alert for more uh, ARIA communications, especially where we might be talking, I suspect, a lot closer to the, the, uh, the date in 2023 with forms revisions to accommodate much of what we've talked about today. So patience, 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 Matt, that's what I would say and continue on business. Can I just throw in one quick thing? Somebody a year and a half ago, because there was a consultation paper uh, referencing self-represented and such, somebody said, why do you still have forms for customer? That was a year and a half ago. So we're still getting those kinds of comments and it really is disheartening that we're, you know, we're hearing members a little bit confused, but we know that uh, patience and continued communication will help them along the way. So don't make any drastic changes until you've you've done that analysis and you've double checked, triple checked Matt. Thanks for having me here today. It was great to see all the questions. Yeah, thanks Cassandra. And we're so appreciative of your expertise and your knowledge uh, for, for all of these, uh, these questions from members, but also all the work that's gonna happen in the future with our forums and with our uh, information that we'll be providing to members. Uh, David Tang, any, any sort of closing remarks you wanna offer? Yeah, maybe just one thing. I noticed actually not in the Q&A, but in the chat, there was a question about what uh, uh, ARIA intended to do with the auctioneer's exemption. And there was a suggestion uh, that when you, when Matt or uh, Ray referenced strengthening the exemption, that was to allow more auctioneers to do more things. I think that's the exact opposite of what I think uh, ARIA is trying to do here. So for the person who asked that question, I just thought uh, it was useful to point out that strengthening means uh, restricting the, rest, uh, the 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 exemption. Yes, and making sure that uh, auctioneers are following uh, the same kinds of rules that uh, registrants have to follow when it comes to, in particular, to protecting uh, the clients that they're serving. So thank you for that, David. Okay, folks, this is uh, this is uh, the end. We're wrapping up our our session today. I just want to remind everyone that again, we're going to be circulating uh, uh, the recording of this presentation uh, to all members, as well as some additional. Uh, information and, and, and documents and, and resources for you uh, in these sort of early stages, as, as Cassandra referenced, nothing, no changes are imminent at this stage uh, on, on these new regulations are coming into force in April of 2023. So we have some time to get ready for that. And our association is going to be working uh, very hard to prepare you with uh, some additional webinars coming up in the future, as well as uh, some more information um, through our forms, uh, forms committee. So uh, Ray, I wanna pass things back to you for the final word and concluding remarks to our group uh, here today. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I really just wanna say thank you to the members of the task force who have served with me on uh, the heavy lifting that we've done. Uh, I'm not gonna mention them all, but if you're on here, guys, thank you very much for your hard work. But the real all-stars here is our ARIA staff. Uh, they've done a lot of heavy lifting. They've spent a lot of time working around the clock. We were handed a very aggressive timeline, a lot of times from the government to respond to what they were submitting to us. And the team stepped up and delivered and hit a home run every single time. So thank you to the ARIA staff and our, our, our external counsel as well. Uh, you know, you, you did a great job. And what rings true in my mind every time when I see the government respond with ARIA is what a trusted and respected organization ARIA and its staff are. The government does look to ARIA uh, for all things real estate. So kudos to the ARIA team. And I think the number one thing that we need to take away from this high level summary is keep an eye out on for future webinars. As Cassandra said, that there's a lot of changes coming. We need to make sure we get it right. And uh, thank you to Aria for making sure that we're going to be well prepared prior to that April 2023 deadline. And that's it. And thanks, everybody. Happy summer. Stay cool on this hot day. And uh, if you have any questions, remember that email address, governmentrelations.aria.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.